Welcome everyone to Designing a Logo feature, uh, presented by Flatiron School. Uh, this will be a great workshop, really give you, uh, I think, the understanding of product design and then uh, using the designing of a logo to really demonstrate the process. So uh, my name is Jelani. I will be here available on the chat if you have any issues. Um, I will be fielding the chat as well. So Tyler, if any questions come up, uh, I'll try to throw them your way. Uh, I'll try not to interrupt too much, but uh, but yeah. And just for a few things, one, uh, you know we're recording. And number two, uh, the chat is again, a few people joined late, uh, is our primary source of communication. So no need for the Q&A section. You don't have to use the Q&A. Uh, if you want to, that is up to you, but this will be our main source. And make sure once again in the chat, right above where it says, where you type your message, just hit that button that says, uh, if it says host and panelists, drop down to everyone so we can all see each other's conversation. Now, with that being said, I will pass it off to Tyler. This is your instructor for the day. Tyler, this is your class. Excellent. All right. Thanks for the setup. Appreciate it. And so nice to virtually e-meet all of you, uh, or at least those in the chat. I saw somebody is from Columbus, Ohio, my hometown. Go Bucks! Even wearing my brown stuff today. Got to represent Ohio when I can, but I live in Chicago now. Uh, a little bit colder. So for today's workshop, to get this thing kicked off and rolling, um, today's all about logo design. And we're going to scaffold up to that, uh, or more so actually drill down into it, because we're going to start with covering some concepts around what is product design and how in the world does something as focused as logos fit in the umbrella of the responsibility of a product designer. Uh, so really looking forward to hearing from you guys as far as questions um, and comments. And hopefully, maybe potentially uh, finding a way to share our work at the end of this, because you know you're not going to just going to get all scot free showing up and and you know going through the slides here in the lecture. Uh, at the end of this, we're actually going to try and put some of these um, skills and practices into practice to come up with our own logo at the end of uh, this session. So. All we'll need for that is some pen and paper. So between then and the end of this here in about like 40 minutes or so, uh, try and find you a few pieces of scratch paper that we can just sketch on. You know, that's how all good design really starts. Uh, starts in the low fidelity, the low fi where we're just sketching out our ideas. So let's get started by going through the agenda for today. All right, so we'll spend five minutes uh, Real quick, just to introduce myself, give you a few of my credentials and experience. I thought we were going to have a smaller house, so I planned on doing some introductions around the horn, but boy, that'll probably take uh, the entire time. So we're gonna we're gonna hold out on that today. But I appreciate you guys uh, plugging in plugging into the chat. Where are you all from? Uh, what kind of experience you're bringing into this? So feel free to leverage the chat as we go throughout. Um, then we'll we'll jump into understanding. What is product design from a really high level, 5,000 foot view? What are all the responsibilities included in the world of product design? And then to drill that in a little bit further, we'll spend some we'll spend 10 minutes talking about branding, the concept of branding, how it's used, and some applications out in the real world that we're probably all familiar with. Uh, hopefully, I at least tried to find some sources that we've probably all been exposed to at one point in our lives or another. Uh, and then taking the concept of branding and drilling down further into specifically logo design. So we'll talk about some key principles, best practices, and then of course, end it with an activity and see where we go from, uh, see what we come up with from there. So as I mentioned, I'm Tyler, I'm gonna be your facilitator today. Uh, I also instruct uh, the live program here at uh, Flatiron. So if you sign up for the live cohorts, which are 15 weeks of intensive product design courses, uh, where we take you through uh, a, a total of seven projects uh, to scaffold yourself up to build the design skills needed to create a design portfolio, and then to go out and 
go find a job with it uh, to begin leveraging those skills and collecting a paycheck for it, right? And for all the time and, and uh, effort that you've invested into building your design skills to walk away from this program at the end of 15 weeks with a portfolio. So that's my full-time gig uh, to lead cohorts in product design, which is focused on UX, UI design. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a moment. But if you have any questions after this, feel free right now, capture my email. If you wanna shoot me an email afterwards, uh, if you got questions about the program or anything that we covered today, more than happy to reach out when I get a chance. So if you wanna contact me, that's gonna be the best way to do it. So my experience, um, I'm a career changer. <clears throat> I went to Kent State University, just a little bit south of Cleveland, Ohio and majored in sociology. And my first, I guess you'd even call it a career because I spent about four years doing it. Uh, I was a carny in college. I was making funnel cakes and elephant ears, corn dogs, lemonade, pizza, French fries, and pulling trailers all around the East Coast and Midwest for summer and fall festivals. So that was kind of my, like, I guess, first career as I was, you know, transitioning out of college into my first, uh, I guess, big boy job, which was uh, teaching middle school down in Memphis, Tennessee. So I did that for a little bit. Uh, I changed careers again into, you know, the most sense, uh, the most logical pivot of all time and selling copiers uh, from door to door. And I did that for like three years in downtown Chicago and in selling copiers and meeting with customers, you know, it started out as just trying to interview people and understand like, how can I, you know, what needs exist for you so I can sell you a copier? Well, it turned out that, you know, that interviewing users and understanding their needs, their frustrations, their goals, like why they ultimately need a piece of equipment is a big part of product design and user experience design, building empathy for your users and understanding what it is that they need so that you can improve your products to address those needs and better serve who your customers are um, so it was that experience selling copiers that kind of led me down the avenue of product design. And I joined a UX UI bootcamp myself once I, you know, got exposure into, oh, hey, this is perfectly applicable, uh, the skills building, you know, during my sales career into product design. So I did a bootcamp back in 2016, uh, have been working as a teaching assistant, doing freelance on the side. I've had some full-time gigs, primarily in the healthcare industry developing uh, enterprise software for um, really large healthcare companies, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, the Wexner Center in Columbus, Ohio, uh, associated with Ohio State University, the Cancer Research Center, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, Kaiser Permanente for those on the West Coast. So I've designed software for these major healthcare systems, uh, but I've also worked as small as um, in Columbus, actually, I'm going to keep calling on the Columbus people because I got a lot of connects there, uh, doing some small business stuff, helping them with their branding. Uh, I had a buddy who was launching a barbershop. I put together all of his um, branding materials with logos um, and printed, printable collateral like business cards, flyers, signs, um, uh, awnings, whatever it is that you can apply design and logos to. Uh, I've done it for the, for the very small and for the very large. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of experience over the last five going on six years now in the world of product design. The last couple of years though, however, I've been teaching uh, full-time with Flatiron School, leading their UX UI program formally and now is product design. Uh, so those used to be two separate entities. And now with our program, which is really freaking awesome, is no longer do you pick, you know, do I want to focus on user experience or user interface design? We've married the two courses and joined it under the umbrella of product design. And we'll talk a little bit more about the responsibilities of each of those disciplines in this next in the next few slides. So uh, I am a career changer, like a lot of people who are joining in here today and will be joining Flatiron in the near future, hopefully. So I've got firsthand experience. So again, you know, if you want to reach out and talk about what that experience is like, hey, I'm a really good resource to do that because I've made a living ever since, you know, doing taking that leap of faith into the boot camp world, uh, building up my skills, and then going out and making those work for me. Um, so I've worked with hundreds of students over the last five years who've gone on to have super successful careers, you know 
again, some at like the small startups, but others who have gone on like right away to go work at Facebook, IBM Watson, uh, Uber, just really awesome products that we probably are all familiar with in our everyday lives. So <laughs> this is the part where I go around the room and ask you guys, uh, where are you from and your favorite superhero? Uh, because, well, one, it's a good icebreaker, but two, it's gonna be super relevant to what we're doing at the end of the course uh, tonight. So let's just go ahead and move on and get into product design. So the first concept we're gonna cover obviously is product design. It's a very vast topic that covers so much. There's so many different skills and disciplines that are involved and methodologies that are used uh, when utilizing product strategy, product management and product design. So we're gonna talk about what that looks like on a really high level and drill into what's relevant about product design specifically when dealing with logo design. So product design is something that, whether we know it or not, we encounter every single day with almost every single thing that we interact with. From, you know, I got a can of LaCroix here. This was very intentionally designed as a product. There were decisions made consciously about how this thing should be used to your cars, to a refrigerator. Uh, we don't really stop to think about design unless it's poorly designed. Uh, like pulling on a handle when you're trying to leave a building, but it's only, but it only pushes, right? It has that handle. You think it should come this way, but the only way out is to push through. We don't really think about the design of the thing until it works against us, until it operates in a way that we don't expect. Um, and that is an indication of potentially poor design uh, was because good design goes unnoticed. It goes unnoticed because it's intuitive. Good design, people know what to do with it. Uh, think about the, uh, the handles on your refrigerator door, right? There is a very clear way in which that is supposed to be used and how it's designed. When you look at it, there is something that we call in the world of design called affordance. And affordance means that intuitively, you know how the thing is supposed to be used. So like a refrigerator, good design has clear affordances. Uh, it means the designs makes the action clear to the user or hence to how it should be used. So product design includes almost everything that we think of when it comes to design from, you know, the tangible products, the digital products, and how we talk about products as consumers uh, out in the real world and out in the market. It marries, product design does, it marries the fundamentals of user experience design and user interface design with the goals and needs of the business or company that you're working for. Uh, there's a massive emphasis on evaluating the current market offerings and viewing them uh, as competitors to identify trends and opportunities into the market so that you can better your products based on user expectations, user needs, and what are other opportunities being created by new features companies are creating. So at the end of the day, Product design is a process of research, analysis, and then prototyping uh, our designs to convert the ideas in our head into actual tangible products that people can interact with uh, in the real world. So let's visualize the responsibilities of a product designer. Oh. Well, I guess I kind of talked through these when I, I should have been loading up these bullet points. I was looking uh, at this screen versus over here. So it's, like I said, a marriage of user experience and user interface. But let's talk a little bit or visualize what that actually means, right? So let's start here with this massive umbrella of product design. What all falls in it? Uh, it's all encompassing. So the basic building blocks, as I mentioned up to this point, are user experience design, and user interface design. The responsibilities of each of these specializations can be absorbed by the product designer. So I've worked on design teams where we have an overall product designer who's responsible for the entire product and everything that we're about to discuss. And underneath that product designer is a user experience designer and a user interface designer where they have more focused responsibilities uh, when it comes to the development, the design development, launch and management of any product, uh, whether that's digital or physical. So let's talk about more explicitly 
what responsibilities a UX designer has. Let me get through here. So user research, understanding the audience and empathizing them. What are, and empathizing with them, sorry. What are their goals, their needs, their frustrations, their motivations, so that we truly understand who it is that we're designing for. Uh, analysis, finding patterns in the data that we've gathered from our research and grouping them together <clears throat> to, form a, to form synthesis, to draw new conclusions or new insights from sets of data that we've conducted in our user research. Uh, then we have feature design. If you have a cool idea for how a feature would be implemented, a UX designer designs how to integrate that into the existing product. They're also responsible for workflows. You know, when we do have that idea for a really cool feature to integrate into a new product, showing how users navigate the product to accomplish their goals. UX designers also create things called personas. These are tools used to represent the target audience and to build empathy with the end user. Uh, they also are user-centered minded when it comes to their designs, meaning that they put the user at the center of their decision making. So almost everything that we do in product design, we talk about something called prioritization, right? When we have new ideas, we run them through a framework to understand how is this going to impact our users? Uh, what value is this going to bring them? And based on what we come up with, we prioritize from there how important is it to integrate this feature into our products? And of course, this one is going to be a common theme across the board, but UX designers are uh, responsible and cognizant of usability, ensuring that the product is usable by the end user, helping them uh, prevent, prevent themselves from running into any errors to begin with. So making sure that our products are not a frustrating experience to use. And of course, on, the other side of that, well, not necessarily other side of it, but kind of in lockstep with that is accessibility. So ensuring that our product can be used successfully with people with any sort of impairment or in any sort of environment. So a lot of people might think right away when I say impairment, something that is permanent, but we also think about the temporary, right? So what happens if I need to use this product and it's freezing outside because I live in freaking Chicago for some reason, and I have gloves on my hand. Like, is it still possible to operate this app thinking about the temporary impairment that I might have? Um, I've even designed an app where it was exchanging bar or exchanging drinks in a bar amongst your friends or social network. And with that, we had to think of, hey, people are going to be impaired while using this. So quite literally, how do you use this when you're impaired? Do we make it, you know, a big, large, easy button for the user, like at the end of the night? That's a different conversation though. Uh, they're also responsibility. They're also responsible for prototyping. So building those ideas, getting those ideas out of our heads and creating mock versions of those ideas of a product to test uh, before we invest all of these resources into actually developing the thing and trying to release it and then getting feedback. So prototyping is a great way to uh, have a low stakes environment of here's my idea, here's how you would click through it or use this product and gain some valuable insight to continue to improve your design going forward. So that's UX. That's essentially in a nutshell. And I won't say that that's, you know, 100% of the job, but it's a big portion of the job. So when we talk about UI design, uh, our first crossover from the other section is usability. So when designing a user interface, uh, similar to UX, user interface designers need to ensure that their designs maximize usability. They do this by leveraging pretty much all of these things that I'm going to cover uh, next that are going to pop up on the screen. So UI designers are responsible for obviously the visual design, the visual presentation of the product, including the color, the typography choices, the icon choices, photography choices. How does your product look uh, in its end state? They're also responsible for incorporating uh, the layout and UI patterns. So making sure that the product is in line with people's expectations. Uh, when I say UI patterns, you know, think about a lot of apps that you may use, whether it's for Android or iOS. On the bottom of your app, there's usually a menu, right, with between three and five things to select from. That menu in, well, the mobile world is an example of a mobile pattern. 
So these patterns exist. You know, when you click a logo on a website and it takes you back to the homepage, that's a pattern. That's something that you as a user, you understand how that works. You know that that's, that, it, that it exists and that is how it functions. So it's up to the UI designer to understand all these patterns that exist for mobile experiences, for web experiences, for tablet experiences, and even things like kiosks in a mall or a red box, uh, if any of you have ever used that. So understanding how UI patterns are used and leveraging them in the final implementation of the product. UI designers are also responsible for interaction design. So interaction design focuses, well, how it's spelled out on the interaction between the user and the product. How do they use the product? Uh, what do they select? What is the input that they give and the output that they receive? They're also responsible for animations, adding a little flair to the product to make it a more enjoyable experience for your end user, or sometimes maybe even out of necessity. And of course, typography, the you know fonts that are used and how what they're communicating, uh, building hierarchy, color, uh, shape, and of course, brand alignment. Making sure that all of these decisions that we've received up to this point and building our interface that all of these decisions are aligned with the vision of the overall brand. You know, Coca-Cola products, they need to make sure that their brand is consistent from product to product uh, across the board for maximum effect. So that you're always, you have the same exact adjectives in your mind every time you interact with a Coca-Cola product, right? So, you know, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, later on, but even think, you know, Every year, you know, we see around this time of year, those Coca-Cola ads with the polar bears, you know, cracking a nice ice cold Coca-Cola, sharing it with one another, like warm and fuzzy feelings, family gathering. That's all a part of the Coca-Cola brand so that we're reminded of those things. And those ideas or words are on the forefront of our mind every time that we engage with Coca-Cola. That is their ultimate objective with building a brand. So if you take all those things that we just mentioned and you factor in the business and administration needs, um, that begins to fall under the world of product design. So a product designer could potentially be responsible for everything that we talked about with user experience design, with user interface design, but also the business side of it. So road mapping the product, make sure that, you know, with all of these great ideas for features that we've come up with, that we're prioritizing those and we're making sure that we're you know, working on the most impactful features and products first uh, to make sure that, well, we're serving our customers and our users in the absolute, absolute best way possible. Uh, this also, you know, talks about like fixing bugs in the product once it's released and improving uh, the product meaningfully over time. So, and when I say fixing the bugs, like not the designer physically fixing them, but understanding they exist and putting them on the roadmap for your product team, which will usually uh, be made up of a lot of developers to work on. So usually on a product team, there's a team of developers that are uh, supported by the product designer. So the product designer may say, hey, they're leading the charge as far as like saying, this is what we're going to work on in what order over the next chunk of time, however long that is. Um, yeah, assembling teams, project management, so a big part of product design is just, there's a heavy emphasis on keeping tabs on the marketplace, understanding your competition, uh, you know, keeping an eye of what's out there to understand, you know, who you're going up against, you know, something, something, Sun Tzu, Art of War, Know Thy Enemy, like something along those lines, right? To make sure that you're staying competitive in the marketplace and fulfilling needs of your users that may overlap with other companies as well. Um, so there's a heavy emphasis on product management skills and soft skills, like assembling a team and leading a team when it comes to product design on top of all the technical stuff that we've talked about to this point. So let's get into talking more specifically about branding. We mentioned when we were talking about UI and all the features that, uh, or all of the responsibilities a product designer or user interface designer, both of them, maybe you're responsible for, and we mentioned brand alignment and market fit as two potential responsibilities. So what do I mean when I say branding? At its very core, 
a brand should typically boil down to a few adjectives. When you engage with a brand, when you think about a brand, what words come to your mind? What words arrive at the forefront of the mind of your consumers and users when the brand is mentioned or shown or engaged with in any sort of way? What are the feelings and emotions that are conjured by interacting with a brand or its products? You know, I mentioned earlier, like getting the warm and fuzzies when you're when you see the Coke commercials with the polar bears. It's very intentional and stays on brand with what Coca-Cola has recognized or identified as being their overall company brand. So all of their products need to fall in lockstep with that to maximize the effect. So what is a brand? Branding is one of the most important aspects of a business. It is the embodiment of a company's unique values, its personality and image. Beyond being a simple logo or tagline, the brand of a company touches every aspect of a product or service. When done well, it helps differentiate the company from its competitors, the rest of the market, and creates a resonating image in the mind of the consumer that attracts and retains loyal customers for potentially life, right? So if you align your brand with the values of your users, people recognize that. They understand that. I'm sure most of the people in the audience today have some sort of brand loyalty in one way, shape, or another because they do really awesome things. Uh, not to like throw a plug because I'm not getting paid by them <laughs> at all, but I'm a big Chewy supporter. Love my, love my pet. They're very personable and I like the way they go about business and their branding really aligns with my values as a consumer. So even as a product designer, I fell, I fell into the trap, you know, but I also understand it. I see, I see what they're doing and I recognize it. I understand it, but there's, they still do an excellent job when it comes to their overall branding across all of their products uh, and services and how they engage with their, with their customers. Anyways, done giving Chewy a plug here. Uh, <laughs> so what can a brand do? It is often, again, as I mentioned, the first impression and what most people will and most people will interact with a brand before ever seeing the product or engaging with the company behind it. Uh, a brand gives a credible voice and a way for people to perceive a product or company without having to say a single word, right? Look how much I was just, you know, pumping up Chewy. And many of you probably have no idea what Chewy even is, but you start to look at their logo, some of their, you know, some of the things they put out there, or even how I'm talking about Chewy. And you're like, oh, wow, like that's, huh, might want to look into them. Uh, they may align with what I'm looking for as a pet owner. So that's just kind of like a piece of it, right? So the benefits of having a brand that is far reaching and can mean, and they can, the benefits for having a brand is far reaching and can mean the difference between success and failure for a company. Uh, some reasons why you might, some reasons why branding is important to a company. Well, right here on the screen, on this slide, promoting products, setting the company apart from competition, telling and communicating about core values of the company, guiding company culture, even taking away from the aspect of the external where we're focused on our users, but internally, uh, how do we communicate with our own employees? What do, uh, what do internal messages and branding look like? It should be consistent with the outside, right? Um, helping customers know what to expect and providing clarity and direction for your end users and customers. There's a lot, there's a lot to consider when it comes to a brand. Uh, even just on this slide, you know, it shows that it's far reaching. It's beyond just one single thing. It's beyond a logo or beyond uh, an email campaign. Um, the brand is all reaching. You know, everything that the company produces or is engaged with needs to be aligned with its brand values. Uh, so there's lots to consider when building and maintaining a brand. So talking about brand touch points specifically, customers interact with brands through some things I mentioned already, uh, the products that are being used, commercials that are put out by that company, advertising, jingles, you know, maybe we're, we're the kickback to like the, the 1950s, although they're kind of coming back in a way a little bit, uh, press releases. So, you know, a company may have a philanthropic effort, like let's say Chewy, they you know do something that's aligned with their brand, supporting a local animal shelter. They do a press release about it, very much in line with their brand and what they're putting out there is being a representation of their company and their company's values. 
uh, marketing events. You know, you think of any festival you've been to or concert or sporting event, you know, usually there's tents and booths set up from all, all various companies. A lot of times those companies are maybe not direct competitors, but tertiary competitors. They're somewhat related to the space. There's a crossover in users uh, and not just in users, but there might be a crossover in values. So how can my smaller company or even larger company just associate my brand with whatever the event is? So anything that happens as far as a company needs to consider what is, what is the messaging and tone that we're putting out there? Thinking about this in a little bit more like actual visual context, how does a logo fit into a company's overall brand, right? I've just been like yapping about brand, 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 brand. And there's so many pieces to it. But we mentioned at the top of this call, the logo is kind of like the epicenter of the brand. It's the very first thing that we probably recognize and see and engage with as consumers. So a logo, now that we're introducing this concept, is a central identifiable visual element that helps customers discover, share, and remember that company's brand, right? So all of those good feelings that they're throwing out there, a logo is a way to attach all those things to one thing, right? So when I see that Coca-Cola logo, instantly I'm just thinking like polar bears, you know, family, they're sharing Coca-Colas with one another, you know, it's nice and wholesome. And all of those thoughts and feelings and memories are conjured up because it's tied to a logo. So every time I see that logo, I think of those commercial campaigns. I think of all of the good feelings that, you know, I've experienced in watching like Coca-Cola advertising, you know, and like all of those, all of those things, they add up, you know, and just like the little by little by little, uh, they all attach themselves to the brand. So that when you see that logo, that is the first thing that comes to the front of your mind. So a logo is incredibly important. It's one of like the most central uh, components of building a successful brand. So it's just one piece of the overall um, visual components package, if you will, that is paired with style guidelines and used as a framework to ensure the corporate image is cohesive and consistent. Uh, think about the mediums that we mentioned earlier. Uh, there are more components used in ads, whether they're written or uh, TV ads or uh, radio ads, than just the logo that's being used. So the logo being the center that everything's tied to, there's an entire identity and system that needs to be built around that. We need to make sure if we're Coca-Cola that we're being consistent with the typefaces that we're using in all of our different uh, communications, whether it's internal or external. So making sure that there's consistency amongst those things so that as we put out messaging, as we engage with users, that all of those thoughts and feelings, because they're so consistent and with our logo uh, in the central, like at the epicenter of all this, that it's all tied back to the logo. And it just continues to pile on all those good, happy feelings that are associated with that brand into the logo. So um, some things we think about as far as like the identity and part of the design system. Uh, and that's one thing that we really focus on heavily in the design program or building out design systems is what is what are the typefaces being used? What are the colors being used? How are they being used? What is the tone of voice that our uh, communications use? You know, is it cheery, happy and uh, fun or is it something that's a little bit more official, uh, official, official, credible, authoritative, right? Maybe that's a better brand identity for a university or for a public services um, department, right? So thinking about how all of those things are all a part of the larger system to keep the brand consistent. And of course, all a part of the larger brand and experience customers will have when engaging with any of its products or services. It also represents the conversation that customers are having uh, about the company and how that spreads. So, I mean, I kind of shoehorn myself into it. I, I, and I promise I totally didn't intend to like bring up the whole chewy thing. Um, but you see how that even begins to fold into my experience and I begin to spread that elsewhere. And it's all consistent with their branding. So whew, brands, oof, boy, I said we'd get away from it. Let's get away from it. Let's talk more specifically about logos. So when we talked about a brand, the first thing that comes to mind is the company logo. The logo is one of the most iconic symbols of a company's image, and it's also one of the hardest things to create. Uh, 
A logo has to capture the company's values, its identity, all while being aesthetically pleasing and memorable and distinct from the rest of its competition in the space that it's in. Uh, as designers, which I hope a lot of you, you know, come down this path, um, at one point or another in your career, you will be asked to create a logo, whether it is for a company large or small, or maybe even for like a kickball team, like an intramural team. Uh, maybe you have an initiative at work, you know, like uh, we had a Euchre club at work uh, for when I was doing that whole healthcare thing. I did a logo for our Euchre club, right? Uh, so it could be something as serious as coming up with a logo for an entire brand and for um, a company, you know, as large as Kaiser Permanente, or you could be doing it for something, you know, that is as small and low stakes as your after work euchre club. Uh, so, but they all apply the same principles. Good logo design adheres to the same principles and utilizes, um, well, a lot of tips and tricks that we're gonna, we're gonna cover here. And well, I'm not gonna give you all of the secret sauce. I'm gonna go through like probably five or seven uh, best practices on top of the um, just basic design principles when designing a logo. So let's look at some and talk about what makes them successful and the thoughts uh, and the thoughts behind creating them. Like how did they land where they, where they did? But before we do that, before we get into the visual stuff, let's talk about the types of logos that we're about to see. Because I think even recognizing like right away that, hey, there's really only three types of logos that you're going to encounter in the wild. They are a logo type, icon or symbol uh, and a combination mark. So you're going to start to see the world differently after getting on this, after hopping on this call, you're going to recognize that any brand you engage with their logo is really falls firmly in one of three buckets. And a lot of companies, especially the bigger ones, have a version of each. They have just a logo type, just an icon, and just a combination mark that they can use in all different types of mediums. So let's talk about what each of these mean. All right, first, uh, logo type. This is also known as a word mark. This incorporates the company or brand name in a stylized type treatment. So it's quite literally spelling out the company name with just a little bit of design flair, but there's no real graphics or anything extra associated with it. It's just how are they stylizing the font face or the script of their company or brand name? So this is a logo type. Then we have icon or symbols uh, as far as logos. An icon is usually an uncomplicated image that is emblematic of the company or product. The imagery is usually instantly recognizable, it's memorable, and it's very clear. So these are all examples of really successful, highly recognizable uh, icon or symbol logos. And of course, as you probably could have guessed leading up to this, talking about what well, you have your word mark, you have your icon, there's also a marriage of the two, the combination mark. So this type of logo uses both the text and the symbol uh, to create the company brand image. The text is typically concise and provides supplemental clarity to the brand mark. So I feel like all of these examples on the screen, most of us have probably engaged with uh, many, if not all of these, or at least recognize all of these. So these are all combination word marks where they started with uh, the actual word mark itself and paired it with their, um, their icon or symbol logo. So these could potentially live on their own and separate from one another, but in some mediums be joined together. So Airbnb, I'm sure we've all seen, you know, both of these things being used separately as their own individual things, both the icon and the typography associated with it. Uh, same can be said for Puma. You know, if you've ever used like, ever bought some, ever bought a pair of Pumas, you know, you might get some with just the Puma on the tongue and then on the side, you know, actually spells out Puma or vice versa, a Puma on the side and the word mark on the tongue of it. Uh, so you've probably seen these used close together, but not necessarily in the same thing. But in this presentation, in this medium, they're joined together as a combination mark. So what makes a logo effective? 
there are some guidelines that exist as principles. And today we're just going to talk through five of them and show some examples of each. So the first, it's simple. Simplicity makes a logo easy to recognize. It makes it versatile and memorable. And kind of on the other side of that coin, and I hate like using the word in the definition because on the other side of this is memorable. So an effective logo is a logo design that should be, well, memorable, which is achieved by keeping it simple yet appropriate to the space that it lives in, to the market that it lives in. Um, a good logo is also something that will stand the test of time. You gotta ask yourself as you're creating logos or evaluating a logo, because all five of these principles that we're going to talk about, maybe these aren't necessarily things that you're thinking about when you're designing a logo in its first iteration, the very first time you go through it. But these five principles are a great way to evaluate a logo. So once something already exists, you know, does it feel simple? Does it feel memorable? Is it timeless? And then we're going to get into some of these others. So with timeless in mind, is this still going to be an effective design 10, 20, or 50 years from now? Um, and for that reason, it's best to stay away from trends. I'm not sure how many of you guys on the call right now, but you remember a few years ago uh, when like every new product there was like, or like any pop-up that you'd come across, any new shop that opened up, there was a mustache in the logo. Uh, that, <laughs> that was, those are dark times, man. I remember that, like everything that came out, like it was just like, oh, like glasses and mustache, you know, and like, this is like our company thing. I felt like a lot of that was like those like home delivery boxes. You know, of course it started with like maybe like Dollar Shave Club, but like then it became like other things that weren't really relevant to that. But hey, mustaches are very trip and trip. They're very hip and uh, on trend right now. So those kinds of logos, those kinds of products, probably aren't going to stand the test of time. People in the 2040s will look back like, what in the world was going on with that? Whereas the London underground here, this truly will stand the test of time. You couldn't, you couldn't tell me what decade that this was designed in. It, this could be a refresh from modern days as everything's getting more simple. Um, or it could have been something designed in the 1970s, right? Uh, it feels timeless. Another principle is good logos are versatile. They work across a variety of media and applications. So thinking about all of the sizes in which your logo could be blown up, it could be on a billboard in Times Square on a big digital board. It could be printed on the side of you know some glasses that were give, sunglasses that we're giving out is you know, in swag bags, the stuff we all get, right? Uh, those like kind of cheap things just to spread brand awareness to get our logo in front of people's eyes. It could be on a t-shirt, could be on a hat. Uh, could be on the tail of an airplane. So a good logo is something that can be applied to all of those things at all different sizes and on all different types of mediums. And of course, the final principle is appropriate. Does the logo make sense for who our brand is targeting? Who are ultimately our users? Does this logo align with their values and what they expect from our company, our brand? Uh, Toys R Us, you know, like notice how everything in here is like, there's no hard edges. Everything's very soft and rounded. Um, the aspects are changing, you know, the actual ratios are changing. Like this S is real chunky in the middle and thin on the end. It's playful. It's fun. Like this feels like a toy. It feels like a child's thing. So I think Toys R Us absolutely knocked it out of the park with their logo and all of the various iterations that they come up with. Clearly it was designed with intention and all of these things in mind. Um, so those are the five criteria in which you would evaluate a logo for deciding, is this logo good? So some logo best practices. These are the key principles to keep in. So what we talked about were key principles to keep in mind when designing a logo. Um, those are best to evaluate. Does it fit all that? If it fits all of that criteria, if it checks all five boxes, you probably have a good one on your hands. Um, but that's when you have something. What about when we're trying to come up with a logo for the very first time for ourselves, for the product that we're trying to launch, uh, for the brand that we're trying to identify? So like I said, I'm going to, you know, there's certainly some more that exist uh, as far as best practices and guidelines to follow. But I think just exposing you to these next, like, I think seven 
are a really good way to just get you started with ideating and creating some logos that fit those five criteria we talked about. So what are some practical ways to begin designing a logo? The first and most important, uh, understand what your brand is. Start with adjectives, thinking about what your brand's values are, who your target audience is. How should people describe your brand when they're engaging with your products? What feelings should people have when they engage with your products? Um, have a criteria to compare against. So coming up with a list of adjectives, uh, is our product, should our product be creepy, wild, and icky? Okay, great. Now we have a direction. We know that, oh, it might be a little kind of like slimy, you know, like maybe like, like a, a running candle or like thinking like some Halloween type vibes. Right. But establishing some adjectives before you get going, knowing what it is that you're driving towards, but ultimately, what are you also comparing against? So when you're trying to decide a logo, you're thinking with these adjectives in mind, which one of these is, is the most representative of those things? So the very first step, write down some adjectives to describe the brand values that you're designing for. The second, uh, getting into practical tips, uh, thinking about proportions, type in iconography, remember we're thinking the combo, uh, combo logos, they must be weighted as close as possible together or at least very proportionately. That's what makes for a really good logo design, especially when you're thinking about that combination. Uh, and maybe a lot of you, so not sure if it, there's any Toyota owners out there, but notice that like how they maintain proportions with the word spelling out Toyota and ultimately their icon, being able to fit all of those letters into the same type of symbol to make sure that there's proportion between all of them. And I think it was really clever how Toyota just kind of like Frankenstein them together to create one thing that represents every letter of the word Toyota. Uh, but there's also some science behind actually making sure that each section of their logo is proportional and balanced. That's what makes for really good uh, logo design. Simple icons. So iconography, and we're thinking just basic shapes. You know, you don't have to come up with, you know, <laughs> we're talking about this Toyota logo. Yeah, that takes some serious creative energy to like come up with and to design and to be like very purposeful about it. Cat, not so much. Uh, but it's extremely simple in the complex, like complex shapes are tough for the brain to digest. It's really hard for us to understand and process those things. So here's an example of CAT, uh, a common or a really big company in the construction space of a successful and identifiable logo in that entire marketplace. Um, notice it really their big differentiator. The one thing that stands out is just a triangle in the middle. There's contrast between the color that's being used here, uh, which helps make it pop. But what they're doing really well is keeping their iconography simple. So you don't have to, you know, like go as crazy as getting into the Toyota mark to just incorporate basic shapes, something that is easy for the brain to digest and understand. Then we get into the concept of integration. So if possible, if the concept allows for it, integrate both the text and the iconography as the same graphic, meaning that some of the letters are a part of the graphic itself, uh, or the letters help create the shape of the graphic that they're saying. So here, you know, we see that there's, you know, a man on a bicycle or a woman on a bicycle, a person on a bicycle, and you can see that shape here. That graphic is represented but that graphic is also a part of the type that's being used. That's another way to come up with creative logos that meet all of those criteria and principles that we were talking about earlier. So think about how you can integrate your logos, both with the graphics and the typography. If you can marry those things, that's another excellent step towards creating a successful logo. The next principle is representation. So when thinking about the logo, think first about what the brand is meant to represent. How will it differentiate itself from the competitors? The design should serve a very clear purpose. Think about what the brand is meant to symbolize before thinking about its actual visual representation. So Evernote, a note-taking app, uh, it's 
purpose is to help us remember and to remember the tasks and lists that we create. It is a, a note taking app, right? So thinking about that is its clear purpose to help us remember, well, what never forgets an elephant. So using that as almost like a metaphor, right? To serve as representation for our brand. And it makes for an awesome logo actually. Uh, so they did an excellent job when, when it comes to representation. And then finally, our last principle is negative space. So think about what hints could be used with negative space uh, created by your shapes or what other shapes are associated when you're thinking about representation. You don't have to literally put a green elephant above your thing, but is there any way to represent any meaningful shapes or iconography in your logo utilizing negative space? So this is a pretty common one, probably won't blow any minds here, but you know, with FedEx, uh, it shows a forward pointing arrow and this shows yet you know, they're a delivery company, right? It's all about like keeping things moving logistics. So if you read left to right, um, this is the imagery that they're trying to plant in your mind. Uh, so this does a good job of both what we were talking about with representation, that forward facing arrow, keep things moving down the line, but it's also use, utilizing negative space. So the space created between elements to create a brand new shape without having to add anything additional to it. All right, so I'm done talking for the most part. Now we're gonna turn it over into an activity. Um, I haven't checked the chat or anything. So, you know, I understand we're, we're hitting the, the mark right here. Um, but I'm going to walk you at least through the process of how to begin creating your logo in a very common framework that we use in the design world. But if you need to hop off, you know, by all means, this will probably take about 15 minutes. So I really apologize for running over, uh, even for my colleagues who are still on the call. Uh, so this will be about 15 minutes. And what we're going to do is utilize a method called 685. And that is meant to communicate or represent six to eight concepts in five minutes. This is something that we call rapid ideation, ideating very quickly, coming up with ideas and not really considering if they're good or bad ideas, but just getting them down on paper. So what you're going to need, three sheets of paper, a pencil, a pen, whatever you can write with, because um, it doesn't really matter. We're just, you know, like sketching ideas. And of course, an open mind. You know, that's anything in design to, to come, you know, ready to say yes and, and to just roll with whatever comes to mind and get it down on paper to not judge the thing until we can evaluate the entire set. So grab three pieces of paper, a pen, and let's get going. All right, so the prompt. Um, what you're going to need to do is take your first piece of paper, and you're going to fold it into eight quadrants. So you can fold it uh, essentially three times. Do hamburger, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, hamburger, hamburger, just three times. And you should end up with eight quadrants. So what your end paper will look like, I mean, just fold it in half three times. That's really kind of what I'm getting at with six, eight, fives. So at the end of this, you should have eight distinct quadrants on your sheet of paper, right? This is actually really good when we're starting to ideate around like mobile screens and mobile concepts, uh, a common tool that we use. So what you're gonna do for two minutes, I'm gonna put two minutes on the clock. You're going to pick a superhero that you are familiar with. Uh, could be anybody, even doesn't even have to be your favorite. Um, pick a superhero. And with that superhero in mind, in the very first quadrant, List as many adjectives as you can associate with that hero as possible. What are all of the words that come to mind when you're thinking about that specific superhero? So I'm gonna put two minutes on the clock, pick your hero and begin writing some adjectives that you would associate with that hero. And that time starts now.
while we do that, I'm going to check the chat. All right, we got about 45 seconds. 45 seconds to start capturing the last bit of adjectives that you associate with your hero of choice. Oh yeah, sorry, Catherine, I just saw it. First box doesn't really matter, but just so long as it's on the paper. All right, 10 more seconds, let's wrap this up. All right, so let's stop it there. All right, so the next step, now that we have our adjectives in mind, uh, we're going to begin ideating a little bit around some potential concepts. So utilizing 685, it's generating six to eight ideas, unique ideas, far and wide. They shouldn't really be related. It's just ringing out our brain of all of the ideas in our mind uh, over five minutes. So that means you're roughly spending about 40, 45 seconds on each quadrant of paper. So spend the next five minutes, give yourself about 40 seconds and begin to ideate concepts around what are some iconography, some uh, um, some uh, the combination marks, right? Like what are some icons, some typefaces, maybe the combination of the two that address those adjectives and communicate the adjectives of your hero. So I'm gonna put five minutes on the clock and let's start sketching. Five minutes starting now. So Catherine, if you were to, if you were asked with, you need to come up with an icon or a logo that represents this superhero. Uh, given the adjectives that we started with, what are some icons that we could create that represent the hero and communicate the adjectives that we've come up with? So if we're focusing on somebody like Spider-Man, I've come up with, webs, uh, friendly, he's a New Yorker, right? Like starting to think about words I associate with him. So what are some icons that I can create that will, that I could associate with those adjectives while also representing Spider-Man? Sorry, I'm just now seeing the thing about transcription. A little late in the game for it. I apologize. And keep in mind, as you're destroying these concepts, there's no such thing as good or bad. It's just getting those ideas out of our head and onto paper. So it's a way to take what we could potentially start to visualize in our mind when we're thinking of Spider-Man, Iron Man, Wonder Woman, 
Green Lantern, whoever it is, and thinking about those adjectives, what is some iconography that comes to mind? What are some ways to leverage these principles that we've talked about up to this point to begin to establish what a potential logo could look like? So All right, we're gonna have two more minutes and I'm really just gonna talk through this last step because we're not gonna be sharing these with one another uh, because we don't all have video, unfortunately. So there's no way to really share with one another, um, but it's a way to ideate and to you know get the ideas out of your head and get them on paper to one, communicate like what's in our mind uh, but also use it as a communication device. Like, so getting the ideas out for ourselves, but being able to communicate with other teammates, other designers to begin getting feedback uh, because we may leverage these to, you know, compare against those criteria we talked about. Is this simple enough? Is this timeless? Is this something that is memorable, right? We may ask ourselves those questions to determine like of these concepts, what has the most potential to be a good logo that addresses all of those things? Um, all right, let's take one more minute. So the task is just to thinking about the adjectives that we have in mind for the hero that we've selected, creating some potential logos that communicate these adjectives that we've thought about, potential logos for that, for that uh, superhero. All right, so we got about 20 seconds left. You can continue to do this on your own time because I'm gonna talk through the final step here as far as like, what would you do next? Like, okay, like I've begun to ideate and kind of wring my brain out on paper as far as, what are some potential concepts that work? So the next step would be creating a brand new sheet of paper. Uh, create an additional eight quadrants and selecting your strongest concept. So when you're evaluating these, you're asking yourself, okay, what has the most potential when you're looking at your existing sketches? What has the most potential or checks the most boxes of those five criteria with being simple, memorable, timeless? Um, thinking about those things and then continuing to iterate on that. So when I say iterate, essentially means to repeat. So with that logo in mind, what are some different ways that you can approach it? Are there other ways to leverage negative space in that existing logo to identify some other uh, potential um, icons or symbols that may be associated with one of the adjectives that we picked out or maybe a common adjective or a common symbol associated with that hero? Right. So if you focused on like the flash is the first example here, is there any way that you can create, um, you know, maybe writing out the word flash, is there any way that you can create that lightning bolt using the negative space, right? So of the concepts, what has the most potential? And then focusing on that one concept and trying different versions of that concept to improve it. So <laughs> I see a comment here. I like some of my designs, uh, some not so much. Yeah, dude, welcome to design. That's, <laughs> you are going to create 10 things that you have to throw out for every one that you keep uh, because that's a part of the creative process, right? It's, you know, putting it through this framework, this framework that exists uh, to begin ideation. You know, it's, a lot of people before they get into the world of design think like, oh, you know, like you just have to be naturally creative to come up with these things. No, there are rules and guidelines that exist and frameworks that exist. So long as you take this idea or you take this concept and put it through this framework, uh, you do it enough times, you're going to land on something that is workable, that's manageable, that you can take on to the next step. So 
this is really just talking through it. You'd pick your strongest concept and you're going to ideate again, take it through that same exact activity and create eight different versions of that same concept, right? Uh, and that's really getting into the second part of the logo design. We're talking like, how can you use negative space to create additional shapes that are relevant to the hero? Um, yeah, so you do this for five minutes, do another what we call six, eight, fives. And then from those, now you have pretty much comparing apples to apples, right? Take it through the same criteria. Which of these feels like it, it, it has the most potential, uh, that it feels the most simple, the most memorable? Um, Sumi, I think that's how you pronounce it. Sumi asking, I'm really bad at these things. How can I develop the skill? Iteration. Do it over, 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 over again. Uh, it's, you know, if you feel like you weren't really successful with this first time, you know, maybe mix it up, like spend some, like go back, go back to the beginning, pick out a new set of adjectives. And it's just wringing out your brain and going through the process, taking the steps and applying the framework to your concept. So once you've evaluated the second round, you pick your strongest and you polish it. Uh, take a little bit more time on it. Take as much time as you need to begin to, you know, like make sure that your lines are how you intend them to, for them to be before we get into getting into um, the actual digitization, which just popped up into the chat. Uh, I think that Figma is a really good tool to start designing logos in, my personal favorite. And that's Figma is the tool that we use in the design program for both UX and UI. Uh, one of my personal favorite vector tools out there is called Sketch. However, it's dying. <laughs> I hate to say it, it pains me to say it out loud, but Sketch is dying. It's a, uh, I don't expect it to be around way too much longer, but that's an excellent uh, vector tool to begin creating logos uh, in when you're ready to go into the digital step. Um, all right, so you do that, you'd polish your concept. And of course, I thought we'd be able to share with one another. We're not gonna have that opportunity. Uh, but hopefully, you know, if you take this through the process that you can land on something where it's okay, this feels like it represents the adjectives, it represents the brand that is Spider-Man, Thor, whoever it is that you picked. Um, and Robbie, why not illustrate? There's, there's tons of tools out there. Just, <laughs> okay, so that's really all that I got. All right, so we're going to start wrapping up. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess, sure, I'll, I'll hand it back to you all over uh, out there in New York. <laughs> yeah, uh, cool. I hope everyone enjoyed. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, hope you guys left feeling uh, pretty inspired and uh, feeling pretty confident about your design skills and your ability to start your business and have a, have a new logo. Um, but yeah, if you're interested you know, as Tyler said earlier, like, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, I'll send the recording in a follow-up email. It'll also live, in, live on our YouTube channel. So give us a few days and uh, I'll send it out. If you missed anything, this, that'll be your chance to watch it over. Uh, thanks so much again, Tyler. Brilliant work as always. And uh, we are out of here. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.